Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a pretty unusual and a pretty interesting discovery of a potential third type of subatomic particles. Although in this case it's not a true subatomic particle, it's what the scientists refer to as a quasi-particle. It's a particle that sort of becomes only visible and only apparent in the presence of other more simple subatomic particles. Now this concept is actually pretty complicated but it's been theorized for many decades now and it's known as anion. And it looks like finally, after years and years of speculation, the scientists have been physically proved that they can exist and they do form a kind of a third realm of particles that now have to be investigated in a lot of detail. And although by itself this whole concept is actually extremely complicated, I'm gonna try to explain it in relatively simple terms and also give you a practical reason for why this is actually important. The reason being quantum internet and quantum computing, something that a lot of different countries and a lot of different universities are currently actively trying to develop. So first of all, let's start with something a little bit more simple with the basics. What you're looking at right here is a representation of a proton, that same proton that's responsible for creating various atoms in the universe. And what's interesting about this particular image is that it actually shows you the two major types of particles, subatomic particles, present in the universe. Here we have both the fermions and the bosons. Now, in a nutshell, fermions, and in this example it's the quarks that are U, U and D, up and down quarks, with the other commonly known fermions being electron and neutrino, can be summarized as the subatomic particles that need to have their own space. They're basically kind of like the introverts of the subatomic particle world. For each of the electrons, for example, you have to have them in separate locations, in separate parts of space. They cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Which is actually why a lot of matter in the universe, such as, for example, the exotic matter, like the one we can find in the middle of a neutron star, starts behaving so strangely. That's because either neutrons or in some cases electrons start to get bunched up so close together that they actually start to produce a lot of really exotic interactions. They're essentially subatomic particles that do need to have their own space in the universe. Then we have bosons, which are these other types of subatomic particles that are, in a sense, extroverts. They can totally occupy the same space and share exactly the same point of space with other bosons. And in this image, the bosons are represented by these squiggly lines in between the quarks. This is what we refer to as gluons. The gluons, in this case, are responsible for essentially kind of connecting these quarks together. But from all of the bosons, you really just have to think about photons, the, you know, the stuff that produces light. We can technically shine exactly the same light at exactly the same spot, and it's totally capable of existing in the same spot at the same time without causing any exotic interactions or without causing any serious problems to anything in the universe. Something that fermions, like electrons, cannot do. So this is basically the main difference between the fermions and the bosons. And in general, fermions and bosons pretty much explain all of the interaction we see in the universe, with some minor exceptions. And for the most part, all of the visible matter in the universe falls under these two categories and a lot of the interaction of the matter can be explained using either the fermion or the boson. And for many years, scientists have actually thought that maybe this is basically it, at least for our universe, for our three-dimensional world. But several physicists, specifically several theoretical physicists, did not really agree with this because they also realized that if you were to reduce one of the dimensions, in other words, if you were to turn three dimensions into two dimensions, you suddenly have a lot of these other unusual subatomic particles coming into existence and acting in very different ways. And one of the main proponents of this, and also the first person to actually kind of even explain all of this, is this scientist right here who wrote this paper you can find it in the description, Dr. Frank Wiljak, who essentially even kind of coined the term anion to explain that, you know, anything can go on in these conditions and anything can happen. It was really more of a play on words. But over the years, more and more scientists started to realize that maybe he was actually onto something. And specifically, they started to realize that by having only two dimensions, things like, for example, fermions, like electrons, would actually start acting a little bit differently and would start producing these unusual effects, at least in theory. This wasn't really practically proven and it was actually very difficult to prove as well. But the theory behind this was so solid that more and more papers started to come out in regards to this, started to explain how all of this could work, and most importantly, 
started to produce devices that can actually prove all of this and use these effects from these anions to possibly use them in some kind of a practical tool. And one of these practical experiments has actually been conducted by Microsoft, whose team is now convinced that this is maybe the future of quantum computing. And there's a really good reason for this. And that reason has to do with, in some sense, the definition of what anions are. So, in a sense, let's try to imagine what all of this means by using some of the images from this paper you can find in the description. In a normal three-dimensional environment, I can essentially take two particles and have one of them orbit or move around the other without really having it collide with that particle. So, for example, right here, these two random particles, in this case it's just golf balls, can more or less coexist with one another because of the third dimension. Even if I start trying to decrease the distance between them, they can always find a way to not really collide with one another and not to be in the same spot. And if we, for example, think of electrons, this means that these electrons can basically coexist in the same 3D location without really being in the same spot, which they're not allowed to do because they're fermions. But turns out things change completely once you remove one of the dimensions and force these electrons to do all of this in two dimensions. Which is pretty much what the scientists in this recent experiment were able to do by using this relatively complex device. When there's only two dimensions involved, at some point the two electrons are actually kind of forced to be in the same spot which ends up producing some really strange effects. The two electrons now start acting as this system. They basically become a kind of a joint system acquiring their own rules that are not really truly fermion rules and not truly boson rules. In other words, the system now becomes something completely different. It's neither fermion nor boson. And in this case, it even starts to meet all of the theoretical predictions and descriptions of the theory of anions. Which basically suggests that by placing electrons in a two-dimensional environment and by forcing them to do things they shouldn't be able to do, we are able to create these quasi-states, these anion states, that acquire their own properties and start acting as a kind of a quasi-particle with its own new rules and its own physical properties. And that's what makes this somewhat unusual and also extremely interesting. And from the perspective of quantum computing, what makes anions especially interesting is that they seem to actually possess what's known as memory especially when it comes to this twisting or this spinning that you see on the screen. And the easiest way to explain why this is important, let's take a look at this example again. So right here we have these two golf balls in this certain position. Let's just imagine that these are electrons, although that's probably not the best analogy here. Now we want to recreate this state again, so in order for us to do this, we actually have to have this ball move around once, and I guess somewhere around here, we are now back to the original state. So after one spin, it's back to its original position and location where we can kind of say that nothing has changed. But when it comes to these anions, this whole spin situation is a lot more complex. As a matter of fact, for a typical anion, theoretically at least, to return back to the original situation, original condition where it started, you would have to have anywhere from three to five to maybe even more spins. In other words, this whole spinning process can be used as a kind of a memory storage for a potential quantum computer. And this is exactly why Microsoft has been so exceptionally interested in this theory and has also been trying desperately to find a way to use these unusual quasi-particles to possibly create some kind of a super quantum computer that obviously no one really has any idea how to make just yet. And this type of a property is really important for any kind of a quantum computer, mostly because retention of information and also retention of any data in quantum computing is extremely hard. Quantum particles have a tendency to just do their own thing. They pop in and out of existence, for example, they tend to have relatively low accuracy. But if you can find a way to control the actual memory of the quantum computer, and to have a system where the quantum information storage becomes more predictable, this changes the game completely. This now becomes a much more practical way of creating something that we can actually turn into, well, in some sense, another informational revolution, going from the classical computing age to the quantum computing age.
And so according to this paper that you can find in the description below, this is exactly what the scientists in this paper were able to finally prove. They were finally able to show that anions indeed exist and seem to possess these properties that we kind of predicted they would have. And so in some sense, they also discovered this third type of particles. But these particles are not really true particles. They are quasi particles. They are just this new state of subatomic matter that only exists if other particles are already there. In some sense, you can think of it as, for example, a snowflake or any other complex shape. This shape by itself is formed by tiny water molecules that connect to one another in such a way that they actually form this very beautiful fractal formation. But this fractal by itself is a kind of a quasi shape. It's a shape that arose out of the existence of other smaller particles. And that's kind of what anions are in a nutshell as well. They're not really particles by themselves. They only really become apparent and start existing when you take electrons, place them in two dimensions, add a lot of magnetic field to this, cool them down to practically absolute zero, and then have them interact with one another. That's when these anions become apparent and are basically formed by the collective behavior, collective action of these individual electrons. But practically speaking, we're still really far from our ability to use this knowledge and to use these resources to construct an actual computer. We're still years and possibly even decades away from even the first attempt to use all of this to create some kind of a practical quantum computer that can actually use this as a source of memory. Right now, all of this is very, very theoretical and still needs so much more work and so many more studies before all of this can come together and create something functional and something practical. Nevertheless, these are definitely super interesting discoveries and one day will probably lead to something absolutely incredible that we can create as humanity. And speaking of quantum computing, there's definitely another video coming out really soon or possibly is already out and might be popping up somewhere right there in regards to one of the first ever absolutely incredible attempts to create what's known as a quantum internet. And that's something that we're going to discuss in another video. Until then though, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.